Go with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I want to try to tie some things together here. And I'm, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of the Word of God here today, and that is that it is light. It is light. And if we think about historically, we're blessed. What we have in our hands today is the Word of God. It's complete, isn't it? We are not in darkness. No man today that lives in this world really has any excuse in saying, I don't understand what God's will is. I don't understand uh, what God did. Or I can't find out, you know, what, what actually happened. Well, we have light today. We know what happened. We know not only what God has done, we also know what God is doing today with His Word. He's working in the hearts of of believers. Uh, He's established New Testament churches to strengthen believers and that we might go out and propagate the gospel and share the word of God with others and see them saved and then they can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And yet, yet then also we find light in the future, prophecy, things that Jesus will do. Um, The Bible says uh, that the Spirit of Jesus is the testimony, excuse me, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And God gave to us the book of Revelation. It's particularly the revelation of Jesus Christ, what he is going to do here on earth. And if you think about the beginning of the book of Revelation for two chapters there, uh, primarily God deals with the churches and how he would work with the churches through the church age. Uh, One man asked me last week, are we ever going to talk about dispensations? Well, The truth is, what we do is we talk about dispensations. We might not lay them out on a a board every week to give us the timeline, but obviously we know we're not in the time of Adam and Eve, right? That was the first dispensation. There they were in the garden without sin. God dealt with man in a very different way than he did does today, amen? He was without sin. Then when Adam fell, we went into the next dispensation. We went into a time where sin entered the world, God covered man's sin with a sacrifice and offering, and that dispensation was throughout the Old Testament. Then we have that in-between time when Jesus was here on earth. It was sort of a time where there was a preparation. John the Baptist was baptizing people. They were receiving Christ by faith, but not yet quite the way that we do today because Jesus hadn't been hadn't come and died. He hadn't been buried, hadn't risen again yet. They were still believing on him by faith, But it was a little different dispensation than we have today because we know that Christ arose. They knew he was going to be the Messiah. They knew that he had come to to rescue Israel, but they didn't understand how he was going to do it. So people were getting baptized. People were following. They were repenting, giving their life to the Lord. And then when he rose again from the dead, they said, oh, now we understand what all this is about. That's the dispensation that we live in. And then there's going to be a dispensation in the future where Jesus is going to return for a thousand years. But right before that, there's another dispensation, and that's a time when this earth is going to have a tribulation period. The Spirit of God is going to work differently with men during that seven years than it does with us today. So if you break that down, really the fancy word of dispensation just means the way that God works with man. That's really what the dispensations are all about. We're not going to an animal sacrifice this morning. Anybody bring anything with them? No, you didn't. Nobody's going to be doing that today, are they? And during the tribulation, uh, the Bible says that those people who are giving their life for the Lord and getting saved, they're going to actually be beheaded. So there's going to be different things going on at these different periods of time. But God is still working with man. That's what dispensations are all about. And having that light of that, those thinking in our mind... We do understand that throughout all of this, stay with me now, throughout all of this, even from the beginning of time until the end of time, it is always God's word that has been guiding man from the beginning. Think about that. In the, in the tribulation period specifically, do you know who is going to be guided by God's word, particularly the Jews? They're going to be reading the book of Matthew. And when the Bible says, he that readeth, uh, uh, he that understandeth, it's in Matthew basically it talks about that person who is seeing the Antichrist on Matthew 24 and he is seeing the abomination of desolation sitting in the temple and then the Bible goes on and says he that readeth let him understand let's find that Matthew 24 
What I want to say to you is God has always left the light for man and has always been through His Word. Always been through His Word. God has always spoken to man. And it's now, thankfully, we're at the end of this. We're, we're not having to go to a prophet and say, what is the Word of the Lord? Aren't you glad for that today? Um, and I'm not saying that that was wrong for God to do that. That was what God did. God took a man. He called him. He chose him. Uh, and then you read the life of the prophets. These men didn't come and say, oh, I want to be one. God, God chose those men. And he, his spirit came upon those men. And when they spoke for the Lord, often they said, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came unto me. Now, here's what's really great about those men. We'll get to Matthew here in a minute. After they received the word of God, God gave them utterance to speak. And then many of those men, were used of God. And I say many because not all. There have been more prophets that God spoke by than the ones we have, the words of the men that we have recorded in this word. Am I right on that? The Bible tells us that the man came, uh, for instance, David was was rebuked by God's prophet. And he came to the Lord and said, thou art the man. Well, we know that Nathan was more and spoke more for God than that, but that's all the Bible recorded for us and canonized and, and kept for us, preserved. Um, there was another man who cried out against the altar in the Old Testament and cried out judgment against uh, Jezebel and all of those. And eventually, you know, all of that came to be. All of those judgments came to be. And God raised up Jehu, and he was a prophet, yet we don't have many of his words recorded. Pretty interesting. Yet all of those men spoke for God. And some of those men who were prophets, God said, I'm going to take the words that they've spoken and I'm going to record those for man to read. Jeremiah, I believe, has 52 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. He's probably, that's why we would refer to Isaiah and Jeremiah as the major prophets. Not because they did more of a work, but because God recorded more of their writings and more of the things that they've said. And God told Jeremiah at one point, he said, listen, I want you to take and write the words that I have given unto you. He very clearly gave him that declaration. And so it's a little confusing because we live in a world that says, well, you know, there's prophets and there's people still speaking for God. And yet the Bible tells us here that we have a more, according to First Peter, a more sure word of prophecy, which is to say, this isn't something that we can look at today and say, well, I think I heard the prophet say this, or, well, I know he was speaking for God, and I'm pretty sure he said this. What we have today is God's written word recorded, not only inspired by God, but preserved by God, word for word. Think about that today. What a blessing that is to us. Have you ever said, I think God says this, and then you went into your Bible and said, oh, this is really what it says. Well, back then they didn't have that, friend. They had to hear from God as the prophet. And so in Matthew 24, I know we're talking about a lot here this morning. So um, Matthew 24, let's go here uh, and see if I can find. Yes, Matthew 24, there are things dispensationally written to people, not for, for us today. Now, we can read it and see it's coming. But man, the Jews going to read this during the time of tribulation and say, wow. Hey, this is this is that one. This is that Antichrist. Look at uh, verse number um, thirteen. But he that in, shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, if you don't believe in eternal security, you'll take that verse right there and say, "See, only the ones that make it through, only the ones that keep loving Jesus, only the ones that keep doing good works, they're the ones that keep their salvation." But that's not what this is talking about. This is in the dispensation, the idea of the Jews being persecuted. Millions and millions of Jews will be persecuted. The Antichrist is going to make war with the saints. And it says, But he that it shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And that end is referring to the end of the tribulation period. He said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Who's he talking to? Who's this written for? The Jews. That's right. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Now, and if you, and then it says, goes on to say, don't return back to get your clothes. Verse 19, woe unto them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. He says, it's going to be hard for you ladies that are nursing, but pray that your flight be not in winter. 
neither on the Sabbath day. Now, if you fast forward, you go over to the book of Revelation, you find the woman goes into the desert for a period of time to flee from the from the uh, dragon, which is the Antichrist, and the Jews are going to flee Jerusalem trying to escape, and God's going to give them um, his mercy and protect them no matter what the devil does to try to kill some of them. It's a very interesting story. And so these people are going to flee. Now watch. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. That is a great tribulation. So go back to verse 15 just for a minute. Who's going to be reading this and coming to the knowledge? And if you would, can we say it this way? The light's going to be coming on when they read these scriptures. You know who it's going to be? It's going to be the Jews, which right now we have a remnant of Jews getting saved. But in the tribulation there's going to be multitudes of Jews returning back to the Lord Jesus. And here's what's going to happen. They're going to read this Bible, this New Testament, that they didn't say was God's word, and they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And they're going to read this, and they're going to say, Oh, my. Oh, my. The Antichrist, here, here, this is this man. And it says, look at verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. You see, God's got something right there. In fact, you'll find the book of Peter is the same way. It's going to be used by the Jews. Um, during this time, James as well is a book that's probably the Jews are going to understand and see. It's really neat when you study dispensation. So again, just by way of introduction, the fact that God has always given light in, to his people, and it has been through his word. And that right there, we just saw a little bit of the flashlight, if you would, that's going to come on for the Jews during that tribulation period. Now let's go uh, back here, if we would, to Psalm 119. And we want to read this, and I know we didn't, so forgive me. Psalm 119, verse 105. The light of God's word. Psalm 119, verse 105. I'm thankful, too, that this light has never gone out. I was thinking as I stood up here, it hit me, the dark ages. The dark ages. What was that all about? Well, you had priests standing up saying, no one is to read the word of God but us. It's not for the common man. In fact, they would burn copies of the Bible if they were found. And also, no man was allowed to hold a Bible study. That was only for the priest. And according to them, nobody could understand this book but them. Can you imagine? So what? why? I mean, I look at it simply as this. When I was in high school, they taught us, well, the Dark Ages are because they ate, uh, used bread for napkins, and they had candles in the castles. That's why they called it the Dark Ages. And we were technologically not very, uh, didn't make any major progression. That's what their definition of the Dark Ages was. Then I started reading uh, Baptist history and found out, no, 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 no. It was the Dark Ages because the Word of God was suppressed. It was destroyed. It was banished. People were killed by the millions, multitudes and multitudes all over this book. And yet we still have it today. Isn't that a blessing? But overall, again, oh, thank God, we don't live in the Dark Ages. And again, not technologically. Not as a civilization, as a society, but biblically. We don't live in the dark ages anymore. Uh, and, and thank God we're not in that time. But Psalm 119 verse 105 says this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Always God's word has been used as a light. Verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And if you've read some history of the martyrs who've given their life for the Lord, it was always about this Bible. The argument was always of God's word. And uh, I, I can I don't have any examples here for you this morning, but I do encourage you, read uh, Martyr's Mirror and read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs and read some Baptist history. And I'm praying about beginning to preach on that because I really uh, feel that that's something we need to do from time to time uh, in our church uh, just to be reminded of some of the things and even maybe made aware of some of the things that our Baptist uh, forefathers went through for the Lord. 
And it was always again about this book. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Well, the Bible's a, a pretty neat book here. Just for a couple of minutes, I want to talk about its history, okay? In uh, 2 uh, Timothy here, we'll read this again. We read it last week. 2 Timothy 3.16. Of course, you know you have an Old Testament and a New Testament there in your hand, don't you? You have 39 books in your Old Testament, and you have 27 books in your New Testament. And yet, we don't have a title on the front called The Books, but we have a title given to the Bible as The Book. In fact, the word the Bible, the word biblios, which is the Greek word for Bible, does not mean books, but it means book. So God says to us concerning his holy word, yes, they are holy words, but he refers to it as a whole, as his holy word. And as we have 39 Old Testament and 27 New Testament, we still have one book. I really think that's neat that the Bible is referred to as the book. That's good. The book. I mean, what are we going to call this thing that God has given to us that is the most important thing that has 66 books from 40 authors uh, over a period of time of 1,600 years? So from 1,500 B.C. all the way to 90 A.D., God is using men to give us his word. And He's there's all of these books, and they're all put together. And man says, what are we going to call it? And they said, well, let's just call it the book. The Bible. That's good, isn't it? And God canonized this for us. Um, there's a lot of question. You know, how did it, how did it come to be? Well, there's two things that we can talk about. Uh, first of all, we know that it came about by God speaking to men. And again, sometimes some of those men, He said, "I want you to go and write down what I give you, and I want you to record the words." that I fill you with or speak through you with. I, I really think that's the greatest definition of inspiration. It's when God speaks through a man. We can still have inspiration today, by the way. We don't want to confuse the idea of the inspiration of God's word with the inspiration of God. God still fills men and breathes on them and blesses them and allows him to speak for them. But we're not going to add to this word, and we're not going to take away from this word when we have some new so-called revelation. Don't get caught up with the words of revelation and inspiration, because we are dealing in a—there's many charismatics people today that say, basically, whatever God gives us is just as important as God's word, and I don't believe that at all. I believe that every single thing we think we get from God, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Because we are human beings that are capable of deception, and without God's word, we will, we will walk in darkness. Even born-again Christians can be deceived, because we have what? A deceitful heart. Remember that, amen? Remember that. And, and so I, I really, and I, I tell you, I believe God speaks to men, but I'd rather hear from uh, from God's people, well, this is what the Lord showed me in his word, rather than, well, this is what I was thinking about, or this is what I feel, or this is what I think God gave to me. Yeah. Because if you really believe that God gave it to you, I believe you're going to find confirmation in his word that that is from the Lord. Yeah. Because the Bible says God speaks twice. I really believe when God bears witness in our spirit, if we believe that that's God speaking to us, we're going to find confirmation in the scripture. And be careful to walk forward just by the thoughts of your mind or your heart because we can be very deceived. And it happens. I've seen it in Christian circles. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it with people that love the Lord genuinely. They get caught up and they act like they get into this spiritual plane that every thought that comes into their mind is from God. Please don't ever go there. And if you get there, say, Lord, help me because I'm elevating myself and my thoughts above your holy word. I don't ever want that in my life. And guys, I can, again, I can show you people that have toppled off of that tower of righteousness over and over again of those people that think they've got God's revelation and God's inspiration and, and it's just nothing but a mess. Stay grounded in this Bible and that's where the true light is. So um, what, what do we see here? 40 different authors, uh, if you would, or writers and different prophets God choosing to write this. 66 books in total. And you know what the Old Testament is about. It's God's law. It's God's revealing of his answer to man's sin. Uh, we find the first five books to be called what? The Pentateuch, also known as the law. Jesus referred to it in the New Testament as 
the book of Moses. Ah, five books referred to as one book. So it's biblical to call the Bible, which is 66 books, one book, the Bible. Jesus referred to five books as one book. And he says the book of Moses in the New Testament. Of course, we know what that dealt with. But then we get into the history of Israel. The next step is Joshua through Esther, dealing with the nation of Israel as they go forward. Then we find uh, to that part, which is usually referred to as the poetic books, Job, Psalms, and Song of Solomon, these books that God uh, records next. And then lastly, we have the prophets. So simply put, what about the Old Testament? Here's something that people often say. Is it in order? Well, truth be known, it's not. Some of it is in the sense of historical canonicity, which is a fancy way of saying whenever it was written, then that was the order it goes in the books. But guess what the oldest book in the Bible is? Oldest written. Somebody know? This is Somebody? Job. Job. Okay. The oldest book that was written was Job. Job was actually written before Moses wrote all the way back to Genesis. But we would probably think Genesis was written first, wouldn't we? Because that was from the beginning. But and, and that's what's really neat about this. Think about this for a minute. God took Moses. This is this is good. You got to get a hold of this. God took Moses and let him write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's referred to, and Jesus authenticated that by calling it the Book of Moses and the Book of the Law. He gave Moses not only allowed him to write everything that the nation of Israel went through with Egypt and bringing out. But he also gave him revelation of all the people before Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, gave him all of that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Moses receiving that from the Lord? Moses, I'm not only going to have you record what you're going to do. And, 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 and if you study the book of Moses, it goes all the way to the end. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And in the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is dead. So God even had Moses write about his death before he died. That's an amazing thing to think about. And then you go back and you find Moses being recording the beginning of Genesis as well, right to the creation in the beginning. What a great thing to think about. Yes, ma'am. So the Pentateuch means the law. It's it's the Hebrew word for the law. And the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. Yes, first five books. Yep, that's correct. The Pentateuch. Yep. Um, actually, a Pentateuch, Penta is five. Yep, yep, yep. So, very good. Yep. So, you with me so far? Okay. Time's being good to me, too. All right. Then we come forward. And, by the way, how much time was there in that silence time, as we refer to the time of the Maccabees, if you study history? between Malachi and Matthew. There's a period of silence there. It's about 400 some years, roughly. 430, some people say, some 440 years, there's a period there of complete silence where no more prophets are spoken or no more people speak. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Really neat uh, neat verse talking about God's word and the giving of it here. Because there is another person who was used by God to give us his word. We always talk about all the prophets, don't we? Oh, even better. Even better than Apostle Paul. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. All right. Hebrews chapter 1. Yes, Apostle Paul, I agree with you. But even greater than that. I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. He's the greatest man that ever lived. Hold on. Don't read it. You're cheating. There you go, going to the Bible again to get answers, Miss Pat. What is the matter with you? Who's the greatest man that ever lived? Ah, that's right. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times, that means different times, past times, in diverse or diverse manners, different various ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, this is good, too. I always say this when I talk about this point. God chose to speak to man by the prophets. Now, here's something interesting. In the Old Testament, during that time, God used priests to intercede for man in the Old Testament. But all that was done away with when Jesus came. Jesus spoke to us 
And now we can speak directly to him. The veil is taken away, the Bible says. Isn't that nice to know that? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, God said he would send himself a man like unto Moses, a prophet. And guess what's different about this prophet? He got the title of capital P prophet capital p that's actually in the book of isaiah so it's really neat to think about that isn't it how god chose to use jesus as the greatest of all prophets to speak the word of god and of course we know what was he in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and when he sat there in the temple and went and read the scriptures he asked the, the doctors and the lawyers and the scribes and the Pharisees all those questions. You know why? Because he understood it perfectly. He understood it perfectly. He was the Word of God. It's really neat to think about that, how God used these different prophets and different people. Then we have our New Testament, and that's what we're up to here. We're up to where Jesus came on the scene. We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We know that's referred to as the Gospels. These four men dealing with the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. It's often been said, the Old Testament is Christ concealed. Okay? They, there's a picture, there's a, th a thread, often referred to a, a velvet, or a, what's the word here I'm looking for? The red, what's the word for, uh, not crimson, what's another word for red? Scarlet thread. Thank you, brother. There's a scarlet thread, just like that hung down from Rahab, place there a place of mercy was found in the red scarlet cloth that was hung down so mercy is found in christ we see that picture of the blood all through the old testament christ concealed and what do we find when we get to the new testament christ revealed that's what happened and then really if we look at it in matthew mark luke and john that's what we see his death his burial his resurrection his forgiveness of sins his ascension into heaven and then all of a sudden the apostles what are they doing well, really, they're re-clarifying and they're expanding on the work of Christ because now they understand redemption. Now they understand his forgiveness of sins and all of those other great doctrines that we have because of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, of course, next we go to the Acts, don't we, of the apostles. Acts chapter number 1, you'll find probably there in your Bible the word Acts of the Apostles. And it is a great uh, book containing the spread of the gospel, just like God said it would do with its churches. And then we find a man come on the scene that God really puts a focus on, and that's Paul as a missionary. Um, believe it or not, Paul wrote a lot of books in the New Testament. God used him if you added up the number. But if you added up the complete volume of who wrote more in the New Testament, guess who it is? I'll give you a hint. Oh, I got it. It's not really a hint. It's a giveaway. Acts is 24, 26 verses, I believe, or chapters. Let's look there. 24, 20, 28, excuse me. 28 books is Acts. And I'm going to give you the other one since you didn't get it yet. Luke has 24, 24 chapters, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, 24 chapters. So, Luke. And we know that Luke wrote the book of Acts because Paul in the later of his life says, only Luke is with me. And you find as you're reading through the book of Luke, it's really neat. All of a sudden, you hear the stories of what is happening in Paul's life. And then all of a sudden, Luke comes on and he starts saying, we, 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 we. None of that is before a certain portion in the book of Acts. So Luke comes in and joins Paul's ministry at some point and stays with him all the way to the end. And God uses him to record the life of Paul. So there's some neat, uh, interesting facts about the New Testament. So Paul's epistles were great. We know that. Um, there were many that were written to the, as they call, um, uh, prison epistles. He wrote Romans to Philemon, all of those books in there. And possibly Hebrews. We don't know for sure, but we know, of course, that Hebrews was addressed uh, to uh, God's people in general. 
We're not quite sure uh, where he wasn't to a certain group, like we when he wrote to the Romans. We know it was for those people, the Thessalonians, Thessalonica, the Ephesians, those in Ephesus. But Paul wrote to the or the writer, I should say, whoever it was, wrote to Hebrews to the Hebrews, and there's no name given. Many people think it was Paul, but the truth is, we won't know till we get to heaven who God used to write the book of Hebrews. Um, we naturally assume it was Paul because he had such a heart for the Jews. And he wanted them to be converted. And he dealt with that in the beginning of the book of Hebrews, trying to bring in the Old Testament and show all that was a picture of Christ. And so um, it's commonly thought that it must have been Paul because Paul had a heart to win those Jews to the Lord. Could also have been Peter. Then we also have the book of Jude referred to um, as the general epistle. And it's been said that if the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, Jude is the Acts of the Apostates. That's what that's often referred to, how an apostate preacher or people would live. And then lastly, there's prophecy, a whole book about prophecy in our New Testament. That is, of course, which book? Prophecy. If you had to say what's the greatest book dealing with prophecy in the New Testament, Mary? Revelation. Very good. Very good. So here's pretty neat. The Old Testament was like the promise the New Testament was the fulfillment of those promises. The Old Testament was preparing the way of Christ, a preparation. The New Testament was the presentation of Christ. The Old Testament was building a foundation. The New Testament was building the building. See how that works. All right, so by way of review today, what is the Bible? If you were to give a definition... All right, class, some hands here. What is the Bible, Ms. Helen? God's holy word. word. All right. The Bible was written by about how many prophets? Guesstimated. How many of you remember that number? How many prophets? I want a hand. I want a different person to answer. Brother? Yeah. More than that. Yep, about so they estimate between thirty-eight and forty. So usually people say approximately forty. Yep, and the reason for that I think is the idea because if you read like Daniel, there's a whole chapter that Nebuchadnezzar wrote. So it's a little questionable. Like, well, is that should we give that to Nebuchadnezzar or should we give that to Daniel because Daniel is recording Nebuchadnezzar's entire chapter of writing. So overall, I think Daniel gets the credit, but. About 40 authors. Uh, About how many years was that written over? Somebody remember that? About how many years? Miss Pat? Yep, approximately 15, 1600 years. And the reason you remembered 1500 is because it was 1500 B.C. approximately all the way to 90 A.D. So it's about 1600 years. And if you study that, what is, uh, let's just do a little bonus thing here that we didn't teach today. What is probably one of the last books to be? Well, let's do this. We asked this question. What's the first book that was the oldest book, the book of Job? What is the last book to be written? This is a bonus. Close. Same author. Same author. John. The book of John is is said to be written in one of them last ones in 90 some A.D. Yep, it's said to be written. So very neat, very neat to think about that. Okay, uh, let's see. Next question here. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, oh, here we go. The word Bible means what? We said that, didn't we? All right, everybody again, what does it mean? The book. And for bonus, what was the Greek word for book? Biblios, very good, Biblios. All right, Uh, the Bible is divided into two what major sections? Cynthia, Old Testament, New Testament. Testament. Okay, now here we go. How many individual books are in the Bible total? Young person, I'm going to call on one of you ladies. Your turn. How many books total in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament? Very good, 66. All right. And Old Testament, how many in the Old Testament? All right, Old Testament. Miss Heidi? 
39. All right, somebody's good at math. Ready? 66 total. 39. How many books in the New Testament? Brother Paul? Very good. 27. All right. Now, how about parts of the Old Testament? How about we can do this together, okay? Somebody give me some divisions of the Old Testament. We talked about the first one in particular. It's called many different things. We're going to help. We're going to go together. We'll give everybody a chance. You think you got it, Ms. Paul? The Pentateuch, the law, the book of Moses, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, what comes next? You remember? The historical books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Very good. That's the, it's up to Esther. That's the historical books. Then we've got the third group, which is the poetic books. Job, Psalms, Song of Solomon. All right. And then, of course, Proverbs is a little bit poetic as well. Sometimes that's included. There's some, some sort of in its own little group there. And then we go into what? The, the prophets. The prophets. And they're usually divided into the major and the minor. Again, all being important, used by God, some just larger than the other. Major prophets. Anybody, anybody of you know that? What's one of them? Brother Jim, just give me one. Jeremiah. Jeremiah's one. All right. He's got somebody real close to him. And time-wise, too, their, their ministries overlapped. Isaiah. Isaiah. Very good. And there's one more. Ezekiel, also a very large book. Yep. Very good. Okay. Good job. Okay. So there we go. Um, praise the Lord. We did good today, class. Good job. New Testament, first division. What happened? What about Nehemiah? What is he considered? Uh, so Nehemiah is going to be the historical. Any, any in that little line there is, is Nehemiah. He's going to be in the historical because he dealt with, if you remember, the rebuilding of the, the, the walls in Jerusalem there. Yep, that was a historical. Okay, um, how about New Testament? Divisions of the New Testament. What's the first one? First one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Open your Bible and read what it says there under Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You're going to find a title heading, and it's going to tell you what those first four books are referred to as. Somebody else hasn't answered yet. New, new answer. Brother Dick? Yeah, Brother Ray? Okay, now that is a very good question. We have never preached on that. But the Synoptic Gospels are three out of the four books. And that is another question for another day. Because believe it or not, they're not all Synoptic. John is a discourse. So um, that's a really good point. We're going to actually get into that at some point. That's a great Bible study. Remind me on that. That's really good. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are referred to as what? Very good. The Gospels. Thank you. The Gospels. That's the first one. Um, after the book of the Gospels comes what? The next division. The Acts of the Apostles. All right. And then we get into Paul's epistles, general epistles, and then the last one is what? The division of the New Testament. That last book. Prophecy. Very good. All right. And so we understand that. All right. Good little study today. All right. Let's keep uh, going forward here uh, with our Bibles. Keep reading them and keep looking for light. Amen? As again, I think our main theme today is God has always given His people a light. And we're so grateful for that. And you know Christians sought for it down through the ages. They wanted to, to have that light. And I again, I question anybody that, that undermines or says there's no need for God's Word. Or then they talk about some of it and then they say, well... You know, that's written by man. It never ceases to amaze me when you have a discussion with somebody about God's Word and they start talking about God and they start talking about God's Word. And then when you start to say something that disagrees with them, they'll say, well, that was written by man anyway. Did you? Are we talking about the Bible? Because it's either all of God's Word or it's none of God's Word. You can't just pick and choose. And I believe this all to be light. Amen. All right, let's pray here just for a moment. Father, thank you again for our little Bible study this morning. Thank you for what we've read. Thank you for the instructions you give us. And Lord, truly today it felt like a little Sunday school, didn't it? A little Bible training course. 
we need this. Um, we all forget, and even me, I was cheating here as I was going down through um, trying to remember the different divisions of the Old Testament and New. And I'm the pastor, and Lord, I need uh, reminding, and I need to continue to read and search and study. Help us, Lord, to rightly divide the Word of God and realize that it's not just a jumbled up book of different various religious writings, but it is perfect, it is pure. Help us to deal with all of those issues uh, and points of the Bible as we are strengthened in our faith by what we read and what we learn about this blessed book. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.